Have you ever prayed for a miracle and nothing happened? Or maybe you prayed for a miracle and something did happen. <laughs> Here's where I'm coming from. I heard from a friend recently. His sister was dying, so her family and friends in the church were praying for her, diligently doing everything that they thought they should do. But she died. She wasn't healed. Well, my friend still believes in Jesus, but not so much in miracles anymore. It's kind of sad for me. It, it's like, what's the use of a God who doesn't do anything? Right? Especially when everyone was praying just like Jesus told them to. And nothing happened. Well, that's kind of the elephant in the room, isn't it? With this story of Jesus and his disciples, they were going all over Galilee, casting out demons and healing diseases of everybody, thousands of people. And why then did my friend's sister die? Why wasn't she healed like all those people? I used to read all kinds of books about miracles. I'd watch TV evangelists, healers, you know. I've read about seed faith. I think that was Earl Roberts. And claim your miracle, that's kind of the new thing now, I guess, over the last few years. And I also heard Wait a while and it'll come. Sometimes there's a spiritual battle taking place. Well, recently I also edited a great number of student papers from a seminary in Ghana about African indigenous churches. And in those churches, deliverance and healing is a common thread. It happens there. At least they report it, and that's why people join those churches. But even more recently, I've read a couple of very encouraging books, not surprisingly, called Miracles. It's by Craig S. Keener. He's a PhD, and he's written lots of books, commentaries on the Bible mostly. Famous professor. Well, these two books are actually meant to confirm with evidence that the miracles recorded in the Bible are true, that they actually happened, because a guy named Hume some years ago said that if that he had never heard of miracles happening. So Keener wants to rebut that in these books. And what they have is story after story after story after story after story of miracles that have been reported in our day. Now well, the truth is, in my own experience, I've never seen a miracle. Well, at least not of healing, anyway. Maybe it's because our miracle is the knowledge that science has given our doctors and our medical institutions the, and the nurses. Maybe it's also like this, you know, there was a revival in Indonesia, right? And uh, this reporter asked one of the leaders if if it was true that uh, water had turned to wine during this revival when they needed it, and the guy said yes, and the reporter says, well, why doesn't that happen where I come from? And the guy said, well, you have wine. You don't need a miracle. 
Maybe it's like that. You don't need a miracle. It still doesn't answer that big old elephant in the room, does it? Why did my friend's sister die when everybody was praying for her? That one famous healer, in my time anyway, Catherine Kuhlman, she was really famous, healed lots of people, but some of them weren't healed. And when she was asked why, she said she didn't know. Didn't know why they weren't healed. Well, I, I was a pastor. And I had in my congregation people that I would have loved to lay hands on and heal. When desperate for a miracle, all I could think of was, what good is a God who doesn't do anything? Right away you know what's wrong with that question. It turns God into a vending machine, right? It's a pragmatic God. It makes God into being useful for what I want right now, what I want him to do. Basically, what we've done is created an idol. This idol is a pragmatic God who doesn't meet our expectations. Yeah, so, we might as well just limit him to church on Sunday. Yeah, I know, I know, I know, I know. I'm approaching heresy here, aren't I? <laughs> so, let's move on quick. Oh, I wish I had a good answer for this, but I don't. So, why should you keep watching this video? <laughs> Maybe you should shut it off. But, Here's one reason you should keep watching. Maybe there might be even a better reason than any answer I could give. So here's the real question we should ask. Why doesn't God do what we ask even though Jesus promised that he would? I mean, there are many places in the Bible that read like this in 1 John 5, 14 to 15. It says, And this is the confidence that we have toward him, that if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. And if we know he hears us in whatever we ask, we know we have the requests that we have asked of him. That leaves it right out. But it doesn't happen. So the writer of the book of James gives, us, gives God an out here. He says this. He says the problem is with us, not with God. It's because of why we ask, James says in James 4.3. You ask and do not receive because you ask wrongly to spend it on your passions. Well, that doesn't apply at all when we ask God to heal our sister, our brother, our mom, or dad, or whoever. You're going to spend that on your passions? It's just stupid. Of course not. Did I just call God stupid? I don't, I don't think so. But, or maybe it is our fault. Maybe these promises often come with an if. Like First John said, if it's the will of God, you know. If we believe is usually the way it's stated. It's like Jesus says in Mark 11, 24, Therefore I tell you, whatever you ask in prayer, believe that you have received it, and it will be yours. Unequivocal promise if you believe, but it isn't yours, usually. It sounds like blaming the victim to me. What gives? Is it all just a con job or just some kind of ancient superstition? Well, Keener would say no. 
it's actually happening now. <sighs> Some people have said Jesus was just wrong about it. Is it also crazy to trust Jesus that when we die we'll go to heaven if we can't trust him to heal people now? Can we trust him for our afterlife if we can't trust him now? That's a pretty big question. Okay. Jesus told his disciples the truth about this. And it was just before he was crucified. In John 16, 33, Jesus says this, describing what's going to happen, right? I have said these things to you that in me you may have peace. In the world you will have tribulation. But take heart, I have overcome the world. And then he went to the cross and most of his disciples were martyred. <laughs> yeah, he told the truth, all right. <laughs> They did have tribulation. And, and God didn't keep them from it. Most of them died horribly martyrs' deaths. Burned and hung upside down. And How was that overcoming? Yeah, by now you're asking, hasn't God ever answered your prayers? <laughs> well, not usually in the way I thought he would. But yes, he has. And, and, and most often, it seems that God does things that I had never expected him to do. Like, he called us to teach in Africa. I mean, I never would have prayed for that, but there it was. And he confirmed it over and over, and I didn't ask him to. <sighs> I don't know about you, but I feel like a sheep without a shepherd about this. I, I, I think we need some... <sighs> we need to learn more about God's promises to grant our prayer requests. We need to hear from the Word of God. So this is what we've been reading so far. The disciples in Jesus have been miraculously healing people and casting out demons until both Jesus and the disciples were completely worn out. They didn't even have time to eat. So Jesus said, let's go rest. Let's go find a remote place, uninhabited, where there are no people. So they all climbed into a boat and sailed to this remote place. <laughs> but when they got there, to their dismay, the whole shoreline, as far as they could see, was filled with a crowd of people waiting for them. They had run there from towns all over the area. And that's where our text for today comes in. It's Mark 6, 34. When he went ashore, he saw a great crowd. And he had compassion on them because they were like sheep without a shepherd. And he began to teach them many things. What an efficient teaching. There are four deep teachings in this one verse. There's the great crowd. There's... Jesus' compassion. There is a sheep without a shepherd. And he was teaching them many things. You know, I think Mark wrote these in this order so that one builds on the previous one. So, what does Mark mean by a great crowd? Well, yeah, okay, he means lots of people. And they all came running from the towns to this remote place. Why did he put that in there? Well, it happened, but I think the fact that they came running means that these people weren't lame. <laughs> and they weren't really sick either. I think they were all these people that Jesus and the disciples had healed. And they wanted more from him. Well, at any rate, they were a very convinced and very enthusiastic crowd. They hoped for a leader. 
maybe even the Messiah who could deliver them from the oppression of their uh, colonial, I guess, rulers, Rome. It, but from what I've read, no other leader cared about the Galileans. The Jewish leaders thought they were almost Gentiles because they lived in this mixed area. And Jesus knew they, they misunderstood who he was and what he came to do. He didn't actually come to heal. He came to teach them the truth about God. Well, healing was part of that, to convince them that what he said was true. They were demonstrations, you might say. Mark is continuing the idea that Jesus is amazingly compelling and, well, and entertaining with these stories he told. People were attracted to him in great numbers. Jesus was popular. You don't often think of it that way, do you? But I think that is Mark's first point in this teaching. The crowd was enthusiastic, but for all the wrong reasons. They wanted a king who would deliver them. They wanted to be delivered from their enemy, and even this they got wrong. Their real enemies, according to Jesus, were the shepherds of Israel. Mark said that Jesus had compassion on these people, unlike all these other leaders. And so now we're diving deep into the heart of God. Mark is writing in Greek, so he uses this great word, which I'll probably mispronounce, but it's splanchnid. That word is about what you really feel in your guts. It's, I don't know, it's kind of a gross word. It means your innards, what you feel in your innards. It's, well, one of my friends just said, yeah, it's like what you feel in the pit of your stomach. That's what Jesus felt about these thousands of people. Splanchnid is about love, about caring, about hurting with people, about feeling their pain and their suffering inside yourself. Jesus is identifying personally with these people that he had healed. God had loved these people all along. They were his chosen people. Well, that's Mark's teaching here anyway. Jesus loved all those thousands of people waiting for him. He felt their predicament in the pit of his stomach. He couldn't stomach how they were being treated by the religious leaders. It caused Jesus to state a lament from their scriptures. He said they were like sheep without a shepherd. So what did he mean when he said they were like sheep without a shepherd? The passages are referring to reference of leaders of ancient Israel. So Jesus is applying the meaning to the leaders of his day, who were apparently similar in their sin. Matthew 9, 36 puts it this way. When Jesus saw the crowds, he had compassion for them because they were harassed, and here's a English translation of the Greek word, they were harassed and thrown away with considerable force. That's what the leaders were doing. Like sheep without a shepherd being pushed away and scattered. What leader would do such a thing? And Moses even had asked for a proper shepherd in Numbers 27, 16 to 20, this is what he asked. Let the Lord, the God of the spirits of all flesh, appoint a man over the congregation who shall go out before them and come in before them, who shall lead them out and bring them in, that the congregation of the Lord may not be as sheep who have no shepherd. That's the heart of the Lord right there. But years later, during the exile of these people, 
This is what Jeremiah saw that the shepherds of Israel were doing in his day. The Lord said through him in Jeremiah 23, 1-6, Woe to the shepherds who destroy and scatter the sheep of my pasture, declares the Lord. Moving down to verse 4 of that, of that chapter, I will set shepherds over them who will care for them. And they shall fear no more, nor, nor be dismayed, neither shall any be missing, declares the Lord. Behold, the days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will raise up for David a righteous branch, and he shall reign as king and deal wisely, and shall execute justice and righteousness in the land. In his day Judah will be saved, and Israel will dwell securely, and this is the name by which he will be called. The Lord is our righteousness. Sound familiar? So, also in the exile, there was Ezekiel, another prophet. And this is the promise through Ezekiel. Ezekiel 34, 23 to 31 says this, And I will set up over them one shepherd, my servant David, and he shall feed them. And he shall feed them and be their shepherd. And I, the Lord, will be their God, and my servant David shall be a prince among them. I am the Lord. I have spoken. I will make them a covenant of peace. And then down in verse 31, God declares, And you are my sheep, human sheep of my pasture, and I am your God declares the Lord God. Well, that's the Old Testament. Several decades after Mark wrote his gospel, the Apostle John wrote another gospel and summed up who Jesus is in John 10, 11 to 16. He says, this is what Jesus says, I am the Good Shepherd. The Good Shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. Moving down to verse 14 of that chapter, Jesus continues again saying, I am the good shepherd. I know my own and my own know me just as the Father knows me and I know the Father. And I lay down my life for the sheep. And now, now listen, this, listen to this. And I have other sheep that are not of this fold. Now, he's not talking about aliens from another planet. He's talking about Gentiles. I have other sheep that are not from this fold. I must bring them also, and they will listen to my voice. So, there will be one flock and one shepherd. So Jesus himself was the crowd's shepherd, you see. And he taught them many things. There, on the shore, he taught them. And everywhere he went, he taught them. And those are the things we read in the Bible. Especially the New Testament that we hold in our hands. Now... A person came up to me after a sermon where I was teaching the Word of God, trying to encourage their faith, you know. She said, oh, wouldn't that be nice? You see, We don't understand what faith is. Faith is knowing that something is true. Not just nice, if it was. What she said wasn't faith. It wasn't knowing. What was it? It was a wistful doubt. She didn't believe at all, even though she would have said she did. Well, she was a nice lady, but I really sense that so many of our requests are just uh, wishful thinking. 
What good is a God who doesn't do anything? <laughs> Such a God. <laughs> Such a God is no good at all. So, there is no such God. <laughs> There's no God who doesn't do anything. Okay, so Jesus taught them many things. What did he teach? His teaching was meant to create knowing. I'm using that word instead of believe or faith. It's knowing. Creating belief that God is at work in spite of what we see. He's teaching that God's working isn't something that's just nice if it would be true. I'm shouting now, aren't I? <laughs> I feel strongly about this. What if? What if God is doing something greater than what we asked for? Greater than what we want right now. What if our God, who shepherds us, suffered like we do? He says he goes before us. What if the God who shepherds us comforts us in our suffering so that we know how to comfort others who are suffering? We live in that kind of world, you know. God's will isn't being done. That's why we pray the Lord's Prayer. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Okay, yes. Sometimes God will miraculously heal people. And apparently, he does it rather often. But he does it for the same reason he did it for those thousands of people, I believe. And for those African indigenous churches I mentioned earlier, where healings and deliverance happen on a regular basis. Jesus performs miracles as demonstrations that he exists and that he loves us. That's why people are attracted to him. He does this to create knowing, to create belief in a God of love who cares for us and who shepherds us. But here's the thing. Jesus was teaching an eternal perspective that goes beyond the here and now. So he was teaching that healing and deliverance can take more than one form. A dear friend of my mom's, who worked in a nursing home, she was a nurse. In nursing homes, everybody's suffering, right? And praying that they would be delivered. And she said, there's more than one way to be delivered. I never forgot that. And I'm an old man. I. I'm beginning to understand what that means. When you're old, you hurt. What was the way of being delivered she was talking about? She meant that we will be delivered to glory with Jesus in his presence. Then our suffering on life on earth will end. Now that's a God who does something, isn't it? The God who rules the universe works from eternity to eternity for us. He, now this is something I've read, I don't really understand what it means, but it, I think it might be true. God reaches from the future 
into our day to shepherd us in the way that we should go into the future. That sounds like science fiction, but it's, it's, <laughs> it's theology. Did you really think God is only in the now? <laughs> He's in the future. And now, and now he will bring us home to be with him. And Jesus went there ahead of us, it said. He is preparing us a place beyond our understanding. There's the elephant in the room again. What about my friend's sister? who wasn't healed and died. This is what Jesus is teaching. She lives with him now, ever since she died. And not only that, my friend and all those people who were praying for her will be with her. Well, probably some of them are with her now. That's our great hope. Oh yes, Jesus knows what an unanswered prayer is like in the here and now. I mean, he had to go to the cross even though he begged to be let off the hook. And before he died up there, he even felt that God had forsaken him. Have you ever felt that way? Well, he did. There was no answered prayer for Jesus right then. Oh, yeah, Jesus, he knows suffering, all right. But here's the reality about that. God was doing something so much greater than getting Jesus off the hook. After Jesus died, his prayer was answered because he was raised from the dead. And he lives in joy forever with us. He's taken us with him. This how much greater can you get? Now, now, that's a God who does something. So now, we have a shepherd named Jesus who knows suffering. He laid down his life as a bridge over troubled water. It sounds familiar. Doesn't it? It's a song. Oh, my God is with us whether or not he heals me in the here and now. Oh, God comforts us. His Holy Spirit within us heals us, our spirit even if our body is suffering. Oh, trust him. And now I'd like you to hear a song that, well, that's that bridge over troubled water, but I, I want you to hear it by a singer who sounds like she really knows what it means. Eva Cassidy, who died young, sings Bridge Over Troubled Water by Paul Simon. You'll have to listen to it on YouTube. <laughs> 